Hey everyone, Dr. Whitney Coster is here to discuss with you Neil Gaiman's 2006 short story, How to Talk to Girls at Parties. Now this is not just how to talk to girls, it's how to talk to them in a very specific social setting, parties. And even though this story is set in the 70s, I would argue that our expectations of how we want to present ourselves and what we hope to encounter at parties has really not changed all that much. Think about what sort of expectations you have of your own image, behavior, and persona at parties, and what type of person you seek out at them. Because I would argue that we all generally make conscious efforts to perform certain behaviors or project a certain image in order to fit in at a party, an environment in which we will be seen, observed, and judged. I mean, this could be an entirely different story if it took place in another setting. I would say that the majority of people want to appear cool, fun, and interesting at parties. Parties are, after all, where we meet people, let loose, relax, hook up, and be social. It's also where people may succumb to peer pressure or social expectations and thus push their own boundaries in order to appear cooler or more fun. And I think these expectations are intensified for teenagers, people who are navigating their way to maturity and adulthood, who are often wracked with insecurities and uncertainties, and who are, who are subjected to immense social pressures. And that is our protagonist, N. He's only 15, and he's shy, naive, and diffident, especially in the presence of Vic, who projects loads of confidence about girls. When N expresses to Vic his apprehension about girls, he's told, you just have to talk to them. They're just girls. They don't come from another planet. But Gaiman, of course, is calling out the idea that men and women can be so different by nature that they may seem to come from another planet, a dynamic that was made famous in John Gray's book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, in which the striking differences between the sexes is discussed. So it's no wonder that this inexperienced teenager is feeling a bit out of place and nervous. He tells us when they arrived to the house, we rang the doorbell and the door was opened by a girl. I could not have told you how old she was, which was one of the things about girls I had begun to hate. When you start out as kids, you're just boys and girls going through time at the same speed and you're all five or seven or 11 together. And then one day there's a lurch and the girls just sort of sprint off into the future ahead of you. And they know all about everything and they have periods and breasts and makeup and God only know, knows what else, for I certainly didn't. In other words, there is a distinct change in girls that suddenly makes them foreign, mysterious, and other. To him, girls are in a category of their own who must be studied, understood, and discerned. And that is quite an undertaking for a 15-year-old. Gaiman, of course, leaves much of the text open to interpretation because he offers very few certainties. The first thing that I want to call your attention to is the literary genre called magical realism because I think this story can certainly fall into that category. Magical realism is a narrative technique that blurs the distinction between fantasy and reality. And when I say magic, I don't mean just the hocus pocus kind of stuff, um, but rather anything that deviates from the conventions of 19th century European realism, as long as the effect is surprising and the plotting is logically conceived. This includes fantasy, the supernatural, and extreme oddities, all of which are presented unapologetically and go either unnoticed by the characters or are treated simply as normal, everyday occurrences. And because the narrator and characters do not acknowledge these oddities as strange, we as readers are forced to accept them as coexisting elements within reality. And this is what both N and Vic do while they're at this party. While N notes that some things seem odd, he does not react to these happenings as extraordinary. Now, at the same time though, Gaiman gives the boys and us license to find these girls strange, but only to an extent. We know that Vic was invited to this party by a German girl whom he met in a foreign exchange program. And one girl even tells N that she is a tourist. So we expect there to be some cultural differences along with gender differences that will confuse our protagonist. But Gaiman takes it one step further, transforming the realism in the story to magical realism by actually making these girls extraterrestrial beings. The party is a bit of a metaphor, I'd say, not only for the dating process, but also for the ways we handle the challenges of dating and the criteria we use to determine if someone is right for us or not. In some ways, Gaiman reminds us that everyone is alien to another, and so are these social events like parties until we experience them firsthand. 
In fact, N's initial feelings and efforts at the party reflect our own at some point in our respective lives in that he's trying to learn and pick up on social cues. He's trying to reach out and make connections with other people by asking if he may sit down, engaging in small talk, offering to get girls a drink and listening to their ramblings of cloning and visits to the sun. And he projects the image of a cool guy by drinking per note, even though it's a drink he's trying for the very first time, only because he heard someone in the crowd ask for a per note on a live Velvet Underground LP. All in all, he's observing and trying to fit into a rather foreign experience with foreign people. So N navigates his way from room to room, meeting girls only to eventually be forced for one reason or another to start over with a new girl. This is dating. You'll notice that the relationships N establishes with these girls becomes deeper and more fulfilling. And it's noteworthy that the girls do almost all the talking. The title of the story is How to Talk to Girls at Parties. And at one point in the story, N says explicitly, I did not know what to say to girls. N is understandably confused, uncertain, and insecure, rendering him capable of reacting to the girls with a single sentence for the most part. You'll notice that each of the girls monopolizes the conversations. I'm not sure the title of the story is ever really realized. It's interesting that he speaks to three girls and never once picks up on the fact that they're aliens. He does acknowledge at one point that he has no idea what one girl is talking about, but just assumes that she's American, which I find really humorous. So he is aware that something is off, but to a 15 year old unworldly boy, things are gonna be off because these girls are doubly foreign in that they are supposedly from different countries and they are girls. To him, this may very well be what a female exchange student is like, and he's willing to roll with it because he just wants to be beyond the confines of his male centric life. In fact, at one point he acknowledges, still, I was talking to this girl, even if we were talking nonsense. Further, if he's willing to accept their strangeness, then it's possible that he interprets their speak as metaphorical and leaves it at that. For instance, the second girl says to him, the last tour, we went to the sun and we swam in sunfire pools with the whales. We heard their histories and we shivered in the chill of the outer planets. Then we swam deepward where the heat churned and comforted us. And to top it off, she asks and philosophical questions like, where does contagion end and art begin? I mean, this is a rather deep question that can't really be dissected in an environment like a loud party. It doesn't really warrant an answer then at this moment, and so all N can say is, I don't know. In addition, it's suggested that N overlooks much of the girl's strange behavior because he just wants some sort of physical intimacy with them. This is quite stereotypical of young boys especially, and even of young adults, I would think. Consider how many people will ignore red flags about a first date or a new girlfriend or boyfriend in favor of fulfilling their sexual desires. In reference to the second girl, N says, she wasn't the prettiest girl there, but she seemed nice enough and she was a girl. I let my arms slide down a little tentatively so that it made contact with her back and she did not tell me to take it away. If you watch N's actions, they are primarily physical. He asks to sit down next to the first girl and puts his arm around her. With Triolette, he edges closer to her so he can feel his leg pressing against hers. And then of course, he profoundly feels something physical when experiencing her poetry. He says, perhaps I kissed her properly. I don't remember. I know I wanted to. This kiss of course is ephemeral and is disrupted and replaced by the violent shaking from Vic and then it's over. Some scholars have interpreted the girls as the sirens, those mythical female creatures that use music to lure men to their death. If you know Gaiman's repertoire, then you'll know that he's quite interested in ancient mythology. Even in this story, um, there are direct references to Antigone and Homer. Remember in the Odyssey, Odysseus and his men must plug their ears with wax so as not to hear the siren songs. And Odysseus himself even binds himself to his mast so that he will not succumb to the siren songs and steer his ship off course. It's notable that N himself becomes almost entranced and powerless by Triolette's poem in the same way that men become powerless in the presence of the siren's music. N says, I didn't know the language, but her words washed through me, perfect. And in my mind's eye, I saw towers of glass and diamond and people with eyes of the palest green and unstoppable. Beneath every syllable, I could feel the relentless advance of the ocean. 
And then Vic was shaking me violently. Come on, he was shouting quickly, come on. In my head, I began to come back from a thousand miles away. Something profound has happened to N in this moment. Either he finally understands girls, he feels something akin to love, or he's in a powerless trance held over him by a dangerous female. And then there's Stella. If we are to read these women as the sirens, then there's the suggestion that Stella has to lure Vic to harm in some way or another, and he has resisted and run away, and therefore she's very angry. And then there's the possibility that the girls are not aliens at all, that they are girls by whom N is so intimidated that they seem otherworldly. After all, this may be how an inexperienced 15-year-old hears, sees, and interprets girls. I'll remind you that he says, and then one day there's a lurch and the girls just sort of sprint off into the future ahead of you and they know all about everything and they have periods and breasts and makeup and God only knew what else for I certainly didn't. I know I had already given you that quote, but I think it's so important here to say again. That lurch has happened and N is bewildered by it. Keep in mind also the circumstances of this story. N is so insecure about his relationship with girls that he argues with Vic for hours about not wanting to attend this party that he eventually goes to against his will. His resistance stems from feelings of inadequacy, especially in the company of Vic, who, as N says, will be off snogging the prettiest girl at the party in an hour. In other words, N is at a party he doesn't want to be at. He's apprehensive and daunted by the variety of girls who surround him, and the evening ends abruptly and on the brink of violence, all of which N still doesn't understand. So this state of mind doesn't render him the most reliable narrator. This story is also being told 30 years later. Are we expected to take for granted his memory that he can articulate verbatim these rather curious and beautiful lines that Triolette says? This could also be a 45-year-old man reinventing Triolette's words. After all, it's not possible that a 15-year-old boy who doesn't understand what is being said to him could replicate this 30 years later. What is said is much too weird, much too involved. Maybe what he remembers is just gibberish because it's all so hazy and it sounds like alien talk to him. And this is the 45-year-old replacing these hazy memories with rather intriguing, beautiful prose and poetry. After all, how cool is the line, I was here embodied in a decaying lump of meat hanging on a frame of calcium. As I incarnated, I felt things deep inside me, fluttering and pumping and squishing. It was my first experience with pushing air through the mouth, vibrating the vocal cords on the way, and I used it to tell parent-teacher that I wished that I would die. Are we really to believe that this nervous, inexperienced, and overwhelmed 15-year-old boy can remember and produce something like this 30 years later? By transforming these girls into alien, N puts us in his position, making us feel his confusion and bewilderment at these girls who are othered in his memory and in this rewritten narrative. These are a few times when he references his life in cosmic terms, after all. As he and Vic walk to the party, he says, I looked but saw no party, just the dusty glass fronts of news agents which smelled of alien spices. And he further says, the times I had kissed my sister's friends, I had not spoken to them. They had been around while my sister was off doing something elsewhere, and they had drifted into my orbit, and so I had kissed them. And when he looks at Stella atop the stairs at the end of the story, he compares her to the universe, saying, you wouldn't want to make a universe angry. I bet an angry universe would look at you with eyes like that. And right before they arrive at the party, a confident Vic tells N, they're just girls. They don't come from another planet. But to end, they do. He is, that in a, he is that inexperienced and intimidated. The source of N's pressure to talk to girls doesn't strictly come from him. He's also being monitored and egged on by Vic, the self-assured guy who is fancied by girls. N even says, Vic doesn't actually have to talk to girls. It was true, one urgent grin from Vic and he could have his pick of the room. It's as though the talking is the work one has to do in order to achieve the goal, but Vic doesn't even have to go through these steps. But as cool as Vic plays it off, it seems more performative than anything. He steals porn magazines, engages in male chauvinistic language about girls, and peer pressures in about girls every step of the way. But it's worth mentioning that while Vic is told that they're at the wrong party, he doesn't seem to notice that the women are aliens. What does this say, especially since he's so experienced with girls? And then there's the final question that Gaiman refuses to answer for us. What happens behind that closed door between Stella and Vic? 
What transforms the seemingly arrogant and assertive teenager into a sobbing boy who can't even face N? Did he try to go too far with Stella, thinking he could overpower or force her into submission, only to find out that she's this otherworldly, powerful being who could destroy him? Did she undress before him and reveal that she's an extraterrestrial? He does say, after all, she wasn't a... Did she try to sexually assault him and he resisted? Does she emasculate him? What does she want him to do and what does he not do for her? He says, you know, I think there's a thing when you've gone as far as you dare and if you go any further, you wouldn't be you anymore. You'd be the person who'd done that, the places you just can't go. I think that happened to me tonight. Perhaps this is in reference to the fact that he's not the cool Romeo he professes to be, that he's still just a young kid, too innocent for whatever was about to happen in that room. I mean, we don't know. All we know is that N said, I cannot believe that I will ever forget that moment or forget the expression on Stella's face as she watched Big hurrying away from her. Even in death, I shall remember that. You wouldn't want to make a universe angry. I bet an angry universe would look at you with eyes like that. In other words, whatever happened to make the universe mad is unspeakable, and so it shall remain that way in the story. Gaiman ends the story with this. The street lights came on one by one. Vic stumbled on ahead while I trudged down the street behind him in the dusk, my feet treading out the measure of a poem that try as I might, I could not properly remember and would never be able to repeat. I love this line because it suggests he's thinking of Triolette, or of women in general. Women who are so enchanting, beautiful, artistic, stunning, magical, intellectual, philosophical, well-rounded, imaginative, productive, and fulfilling, even to those like the respective 15-year-old and 45-year-old ends who do not understand them. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this story, particularly what you think happened between Vic and Stella at the end, and if you think these girls are actually aliens or just foreign beings to an inexperienced young boy. Let me know your ideas in the comments below, and please be sure to check out my other videos on a variety of canonical literary works. Thanks for joining me, and I hope to see you guys next time. Bye.